Well, hello, everybody. Thank you all for staying with us here at the Aspen Institute. It is wonderful to have all of you. On behalf of the Aspen Institute, Romania, in partnership with the German Marshall Fund of the United States Bucharest Office, we welcome you. I can't believe this. It's the ninth edition of the Bucharest Forum and our panel, Resilience, Pandonomics. Yes, there's now a new word since uh, the pandemic started. Pandonomics and the Great Acceleration. I am Liz Clayman from the Fox Business Network. You may uh, remember me from the last Aspen Institute in Bucharest, where I was so honored to be on stage there. Different world now, obviously. We are in a Zoom chat room here, and we're so glad that you are part of this. And we are coming from all parts of the world. So thank you very much. What we're actually going to talk about here is the magnitude of the COVID-19 crisis. We know for sure that it has surpassed the consequences of pretty much any previous financial or geopolitical shock, uh, second only to World War II. It's produced stunning mutations when it comes to how our politics, economies, and, and I know you all relate to this, supply chains and businesses and how they all interact and weave within each other. We're gonna talk about the winners today. Who will be the winners? Will they be the ones who harness the power to adapt most quickly to new realities and to mitigate the effect of this and future crises? Well, here to discuss it, we are honored to welcome our very distinguished panel. Ed Williams is chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Aspen Initiative UK. He's also president and CEO of Edelman EMEA. Rosa Balfour is director, Carnegie Europe. Sergio Mana is chief executive officer of Banco Commerciale Romana. And Livio Voina, senior advisor of the International Monetary Fund. And by the way, Livia, of course, will express opinions and ideas here that don't necessarily reflect the IMF, but uh, I'm quite sure that his thoughts will be embraced by just about everybody, and that includes all of our guests. All right, so let's talk about this geopolitical and economic disruption. They say, Warren Buffett loves to say that when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked, meaning when bad things happen, you see the uh, un unattractive underbelly, so to speak, of what's been going on. That is very much what's happened with the pandemic. And there has been certainly supply chain vulnerability, dependence on Asia, all kinds of issues. So I want to start with Rosa. Rosa Balfour, your expertise includes European politics, institutions, foreign security policy. What did you notice from almost the beginning of the pandemic kicking off and how, after a lot of the dust has settled, do you see this very intertwined world evolving? Rosa, can you hear? Uh, you're muted, Rosa, I believe. Right, sorry. There you go, that's okay. Um, I've lived in Brussels for quite a few years and I've been a direct witness of successive crises that Europe has been going through and a witness of Europe muddling through. Then came the pandemic and the, you know, there was the fear that this could be the kiss of death really for the project of European integration. Um, and actually we saw the signs of Europe uh, bouncing back and reinventing itself and making decisions which it had refrained from making throughout years of crisis. Um, so I think we've actually seen Europe demonstrate for all its weaknesses, faults, problems, litigiousness, etc. But it actually has demonstrated a lot of resilience. The institutions, the member states, they quarrel, but they're still working with each other. Um, and I think this is very much a um, the, the wake up call that came with the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, the first was, and I, I really want to underline this, the degree of resilience of society in Europe. Um, and uh, this is at you know very much so at the personal level, uh, but also in uh, responding pretty well to all the multiple um, uh, sets of uh, precautions that governments put. It. Um, secondly, uh, resilience in the face of the economic crisis, we're far from the end of it, we're probably at the beginning of it, but uh, European uh, governments put together a whole package of me measures, still some details need to be fleshed out, uh, still some agreements need to be met, 
But these, this packet of measures contains some transformative elements that could actually change the economic and political life in Europe. And thirdly, with, with, with sorry, let me just add this, a, very, a focus on transforming the economy towards a green economy and a digital economy with all the international implications that this has. And thirdly, we're actually beginning to see the signs of Europe growing up to what its role should be globally of taking responsibility. So I say this with you know, a lot of caution uh, because um, the narrative on Europe is quite dismissive. It's not able to respond to crisis in the Eastern Mediterranean, Nagorno-Karabakh, Belarus, etc. We know, this we all know. But um, for all the complexity of European decision making, I can see the light of the end, at the end of the tunnel in the sense that there's greater awareness, there's greater responsibility, there's greater resilience. And this was really uh, what came about uh, with the coronavirus pandemic. Again, another yeah. word of caution because we're entering into a second phase, etc. Um, but it, I, did, I do think it ushered in a transformative moment for Europe um, and that some of its leaders are seizing that moment to bring about reform. You used a really important word there, reinvention. Um, it's either reinvention or forging new pathways. Uh, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, as they say. Uh, Livio, give us your vision at 30,000 feet from the IMF and what you have seen, because uh, from a financial standpoint, a lot of governments and a lot of businesses have seen, imme saw immediate stress. It was almost like a real world stress test for just about every sector. Right. Um... It was, uh, and actually this pandemic has exacerbated pre-existing vulnerabilities uh, yes, to a great yes. extent, yes. And it came, uh, if you in my opinion, a little bit uh, too soon after the global financial crisis. So the wounds of the previous crisis uh, have not been uh, healed actually in uh, many countries and for many corporates and even for many banks. Um, and... Um, I mean, the, the policy response was really um, uh, large, unprecedented, uh, very strong, but, you know, it cannot go forever. So in the short term, it helped. Uh, it helped a lot. It, it uh, Basically, the credit markets all over the world are, are back from their uh, March uh, uh, from bottoming uh, out in March. Um, and central banks uh, renewed unorthodox policies. You know, just before the pandemic, we are we are talking about normalization of monetary policy. Is no longer uh, the case. It's 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 uh, at least not for a for a, for a while. Uh, but um, sovereign and corporate debt all around the world uh, have uh, have been rising since the beginning of the pandemic. And basically, when this crisis fades out, because eventually at some point it will, um, uh, the vulnerable sovereigns, banks and corporates will, uh, will be more indebted than before the crisis and, with, and, and, more, uh, and facing more binding uh, constraints. And actually, the problem is a simultaneous increase in, uh, in sovereign vulnerabilities and in uh, private sector vulner vulnerabilities. And the interconnectedness uh, uh, between uh, between them, which actually reinforce each other, and a measure of this interconnectedness, it's uh, the high correlation between risk assets. And the reason for this is is that central banks have been involved in most markets, uh, and 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 because of this, uh, it's very hard to have individual. Uh, solutions to, to to this crisis. So basically, uh, precisely because of this inter uh, interconnectedness, coordinated policy response is needed to deal, uh, especially with the vulnerable uh, uh, sovereigns and co and companies. Because now we are talking increasingly about a key shape, uh, a K shape recovery. So it's not V, it's not double V, uh, it, it's K, meaning that some some Sovereigns can recover, some countries can recover much faster than others, and probably also because they have more fiscal space. Uh, some some firms uh, are more viable than others, 
and um, um, some, some other firms um, uh, risk to um, to turn this uh, liquidity crisis into a solvency crisis. Um, uh, and I think um, the degree of economic scaling uh, will depend on how the banking sector will be able to meet the demand for liquidity from the corporate sector in the in the coming uh, maybe year, let's say. Um, if I have uh, if I have one more minute, I can I can also sure. add one one word because you started with a new word. <laughs> yeah. uh, the the word on. Um, um, on def defensive expectations, it's you know I have a forthcoming book uh, entitled "Defensive Expectations," where I explain that during uh, during a crisis, rational expectations are replaced by defensive expectations, meaning meaning that uh, households, for example, do not expect from now on an increase in their income, but they they expect uh, to defend the level of wealth that they lost. And the same is for firms. Firms uh, actually hope to get back to their pre-crisis uh, pre levels in terms of profitability, of uh, leverage, or, but, but those times are gone. So it will take a lot of, uh, it will take a long time, both for, for households and companies to, to recover what they lost as a stock, not as a flow, as a stock, because right. in, in the meantime, uh, a lot of wealth has been lost, both by, by households and, and corporates. So, uh, basically, the recovery is not enough that economies will recover and, let's say, next year we'll see um, uh, probably um, uh, nice figures all around the world in terms of, uh, of yeah. growth. Uh, right. the, potential, the potential GDP will still remain below the one prior to the crisis and it will take some time uh, and therefore, the demand will be affected for a longer time. Indeed. Uh, it, uh, you used a term exacerbating, exposing pre-existing issues. And, and just as we had finally come through the financial crisis, indeed. But I, I doubt there's any good time. <laughs> so it came too close to the last one. There's no good time for a pandemic. This seems like it would perfectly dovetail to Sergio as a banker, but I'm actually gonna to go to Ed, if you don't mind, Sergio, because I think what Ed's perspective may also weave with certainly what Livio just talked about. And Ed, talk about having just dealt with crises. The UK was in the middle of still dealing with Brexit. So on the ground there, how, and the United Kingdom has been dealt a very, very difficult blow when it comes to the pandemic, just like the United States. What do you see the state of the situation there and how it pertains and spreads out to the rest of the world? Well, it, it, listen, it's, it's, Liz, it's both complex and very difficult. I mean, the, the, the Brexit discussions continue. Um, uh, Michelle Barnier is in London today. Uh, with Lord Ross, there is a, a hope that a deal will be found, but you know there is still huge amounts of uncertainty. And to the point that Livio made, and I want to double down on this, you raised it as well, which is essentially that COVID has exacerbated a whole range of pre-existing pre conditions. I think that is absolutely right. And the disconnect between, if I may say with total respect, people like us and everybody else kind of remains to this yes. day. And whilst there are reasons to be optimistic, I think Rosa is absolutely right about the resilience of the EU that we've seen during COVID. I mean, who would have thought that the recovery fund, um, the scale of it, the ambition of it, the mix of, of grants and loans could be um, agreed amongst the member states so quickly? I mean, that is a very a great reason to be optimistic. But this notion that, um, we could get past the pandemic and somehow there's going to be a return to the kind of liberal order, the international cooperation that we've seen in the past, I think is for the for the birds, really. Um, I think thinking about a comeback is the wrong way to look at this because many of the underlying issues that Livio uh, points out are still there, you know, complaints around kind of isms, um, in, in politics and business, elitism, nepotism, uh, uh, cronyism, um, you know, evidence that the rewards are going to smaller and smaller groups of people and social, social mobility has stalled. 
um, cries at the metropolitan um, uh, elite, metropolitan attitudes to culture and rights is ahead of the general population, and criticism essentially that the kind of establishment and the entrenched uh, political order needs to, to change. Ultimately, the kind of in a nutshell, this sense that the system is rigged in favour of of elites, and I think those feelings are still very much um, alive um, uh, in, 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 many, in many people across, in Europe and, and, and wider. The, the mistake, though, I think that's been made in the past, and as we start to think about solutions, how do we address these problems, is to equate those points of view with xenophobia, with nativism, uh, with extremism. And that's a massive trap. Because in my mind, you know, the term populist has taken on quite a pejorative connotation. And in doing so, we miss kind of the more scholarly um, kind of analysis of what's really going on. Uh, you know, Brexit wasn't just voted for by kind of why old bigots. It was actually voted on by a whole range of people, including first generation immigrants in the, in the, U in the UK. There's a whole range of people who voted to leave. You know, the mistake of thinking about Trump is that he was, you know, mobilised a kind of redneck base. Not true at all. More women voted for Trump, I believe, uh, than Hillary Clinton. Rich and poor voted for him. But what underlies both those those shock uh, results, I was shocked for both, both Brexit and Trump, is this, you know, collapse in institutions, in collapse in trust in institutions and a um, scepticism and a belief in the system. And this is uh, maybe in the course of the conversation we can talk about this. I think these are the underlying. This is the underlying problem that we need to um, address when thinking about the future and thinking about a post-COVID um, fu uh, future. You know, elite and uh, wealth gap. Those are are trigger terms and words, and it it does come back to what was starting to develop, at least in the banking world, which has long been a target. And Sergio. Things had really begun to change. Before the pandemic, the business community had started talking about a different form of capitalism, not getting rid of capitalism, but, but a different and newer model, one that's more focused on the welfare of the employee, the welfare of the individual over the all-encompassing all uh, big business that, that was banking. But this kind of goes, certainly in America too, for all companies, and then suddenly all bets were off because the world order was thrown into complete disarray. I'd love to know, Sergey, um, uh, about this sort of, of affectation. How did the crisis stop, slow, or change and shift the conversation? Uh, so first of all, Liz, thank you for, um, uh, for having me. Uh, thank you for asking me to speak the last in the first round because I, I learned tremendously from uh, Rota, from Libya Indeed. and from Ed. So I will try to, uh, I will try to fit in my, my view on this, on this one. I'll start with an analogy to, 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 which, to something which you mentioned uh, at the beginning, actually not a continuation. When the tides uh, are going out, depends to what you want to look at. You want to look at the ugly belly or you want to look at the eyes and the soul. Um, um, so my answer in short to what you said is very easy for me to give. I'm coming from a company which is built on a purpose and the purpose is, uh, the one of creating prosperity in the regions and in the places where we are acting. So it's an easy answer to me. It's an answer I believe in. Um, therefore I believe that actually the answer to the future, which marries what Rosa, what Ed, what, what Livio said is actually um working together to build a better society and uh it's it's not it's i know it's abstract but if you look at the level of solidarity which has been displayed at community level um since february march uh this year if we look at the fact that there were pockets huge pockets of expertise and trust in public service not only expertise proven by the public service but trust of the society in the public uh, service if you look at the fact that we have exceptional examples of long-term good governance in the world, and we should actually start incorporating in our countries, in our continents, in our regions, those examples of good governance, uh, all linked by unmoved commitment to the democratic values, 
I say, if we only notice this, that we have all the chances to build a better society. Now, of course, if you want to take, uh, if you want to look at the at the belly, uh, you would say, okay, but how can we do that? We are going to go through an absolute economic um, stress. We are going already. It is for the first time in the history we know that we have simultaneously a supply shock and a demand shock. Um, we are basically uh, in the middle of a conversation which says probably the defense doctrine of the countries or continents or, or blocks needs to be changed because redundancy in supply chains, because a matter of national security, um, uh, redundancy in pharma chains becomes a matter of uh, national security, food chains uh, localization becomes a matter of uh, national security and so on and so forth. But actually all these are opportunities. All these are opportunities which hopefully if we treat them one by one will lead us to, to, to actually also solving Ed's dilemma. How we are getting out from polarization, how we are getting out from uh, uh, instant judgment, how we democratize the democracy back again. How do we give the, the feeling to the people that their voice is actually listened in an era of real time, in real time? Um, where is banking fitting in all this? Well, this is very simple. Um, we proved actually starting with the beginning of this year that our claim that we are part of the society and we are part of the solution is, is a, it's a, it's a credible claim. We proved that in everything across the, across the globe, the banking industry did along and aside of the governments in order to understand, cater, care and support its clients. Well, mm -hmm. will that mean that the world economy is going to be the way it was? No. But for the banking system, I think it was the moment of reclaiming a role in the society and that, that, that is twofold. One, we prove we are part of the solution and we are coming with solutions. And second, everything what happened massively accelerated a traditional banking uh, industry transformation, including digital and data-driven transformation. And this is where we stand. So let's look at the eyes and at the soul and maybe run a little bit in order to not look at the belly. That is very poetic. I like that because I'd rather not look at the ugly underbelly. Um, you just said that uh, we proved as far as we, the banking system, proved we are part of the solution. So people who are watching, and by the way, we're continuing the conversation and anybody who has joined in and is listening, feel free to submit questions for any or all of the panel. We are really uh, hoping to hear from you too because we want you to be engaged. Part of the solution here in America, we immediately, and I know this because I spoke to people at our Treasury Department who worked for Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin. They worked 24 seven overnight to get the Paycheck Protection Program up and running so that banks could take the money that was offered by the Treasury and send it out to people who were absolutely desperate. Um, it was the smaller banks that saved the day, the smaller regional banks who who knew their clients by face. But let's broaden the aperture of that, Rosa, to China and the supply chains for businesses because an average consumer was definitely affected by this in just about every country. There were shortages everywhere. And one of the vulnerabilities that was exposed uh, is the global supply chain. Now you talk about, um, I suppose, uh, inspirational moves and a chance to move forward on this, immediately companies began to try and find different ways and forge different pathways. Give me a sense of where you see that future going, because you talk about resilience. Businesses did, once they got over that initial gut punch, that shock, they started saying, all right, how do we move these around, these supply chains, particularly in food? Uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, I'll get to your question, but let me connect it to some of the, the discussion, some of the points that uh, the other speakers made um, sure. just before. Because, um, I mean, every time there is an external shock or a, a crisis, there's always a discussion about continuity and change. How much is this revolutionizing things and how much 
it, how many continuities are we seeing with the past. So we've talked about exacerbation of, of uh, uh, existing vulnerabilities. We've talked about um, populism, polarization, which of course predates the uh, pandemic. Um, and we've talked a little bit about what of the past um, elitism, cronism, we don't want to see come back. And the discussion about supply chains fits into this. Um, and I think we need to be realistic. Yes, there was a big wake up call with respect to dependencies with China. Um, right. And I think there will be a push towards diversification of trade routes and, and, and supply chains, but it's not gonna happen overnight. And if you look at trade data, you see that actually there's quite a bit of continuity, although there are two economists on this panel who are much better placed than I am to comment on this. Um, so it's not going to happen overnight, but there has been a push for greater creativity. And I think the other big push, and this is more from the point of view of geopolitics, is that the pandemic, dependency on China, but also for those who are not in the US and not in China, so for everybody else who's actually suffering from this um, escalating tensions between the US and China, there is a search for alternative partnerships. And in that sense, we, we can, uh, international cooperation can, I wouldn't say make a comeback, I would say continue, uh, but the global uh, liberal order that we knew will probably be different. But that will be a good thing, providing the underpinning basis is um, a rules-based um, world and cooperation rather than competition. Uh, but we need to think about reforming it. And I think um, one of the um, issues about the liberal international order as we knew it was that it was um, created by the West and the rest felt it was hegemonic. Um, and we, as the West, never pushed for reforms to make that international order more inclusive, more participative. And that's one of the reasons of uh, uh, Russian and Chinese hubris against uh, the multilateral system. Now, it's you know you can't go back in history, uh, but I think it's important it's important to think about new ways of uh, tying in these countries, especially the democratic countries around the world. You know, Shakespeare wrote, "It's an ill wind that blows no good," meaning it's really bad if nothing good comes from this. What about that, Ed? You know, we are seeing some positive moves. Uh, once bitten, twice shy. Uh, a lot of companies will never be caught flat-footed again like this. Um, but can you can you weave in the discussion about what we've talked about, what Sergio mentioned and what Livio mentioned, which is the you know human toll, the human aspect of all of this, and how we recover more quickly? Are there options and ideas? I mean, I think one is, you know. To answer your question about what, what's positive that can come out of uh, this COVID experience, I think is a really good one because obviously, quite rightly, we're spending a lot of time on the kind of public health crisis. How do we keep people alive? How do we develop the right therapeutics as quickly as possible? How can we work together collectively um, uh, for a vaccine? And my sense, one of the one of the if I'm being really optimistic about it, one of the most impressive things I think we've seen is look. It was only February, March that COVID really came to the mass public attention. I remember being, God, I sound like an elite, but I remember being in Davos in January and I went to a briefing by the Wellcome Trust on COVID and I think there were 20 people in the room. Um, and it was only kind of a few weeks later that suddenly it was here front and centre. And between then Excuse and me. now, we have developed... Excuse me, Ed. Excuse me, Ed. Sorry? That was good, was, so that was, good, was social distancing. That's good. That's, yeah. true. That's true. That was definitely social distancing. Uh, uh, although it wasn't full room. Um, uh, but if you think about what we've done with the vaccine, that we've gone from what we've got 300 different vaccines now um, cu currently being um, developed. I think around 100 are in stage three. Um, if we can get to a place whereby in, in a matter of 12 months or 18 months, we have built a global vaccine to this virus, that is an extraordinary thing for mankind to deliver in such a short period of time. You know, remember, think about um, uh, smallpox and the vaccines of the past. They take years and years and years, decades even. So if we can mobilize science, if we can mobilize experts, 
um, to deliver a solution to COVID in that period of time. Think about what we can do in terms of facing off some of the other big global problems. And, you know, COVID in some respects is the kind of a moose bouche for climate change. So what could we do at an, on, an, on an international level if we were to mobilise ourselves against those? So I think we can be quite optimistic about things. I think work is changing. So obviously we're doing that. We're not, we're not in Bucharest. We're all on Zoom. I think there are significant kind of productivity um, benefits from, uh, from working remotely. Um, I'm personally looking forward, I'm actually in the office today, I'm looking forward to more collaboration in the office in the future. It's not the end of the office. Um, it's not a kind of binary thing, in or out. I think um, uh, things will change. But that, that is a big, um, a big, big change as well. If I have a, a, a worry and to respond to Sergio um, earlier, you know, if you look across Europe, the, hand, the first chapter of the handling of the crisis in countries like Italy, France, Spain, the UK was suboptimal. And um, the next period of the crisis, we're already seeing wave two coming through. And then the associated unemployment, a secondary, secondary kind of health impacts. I think that, that, in my mind, they represent a big sort of threat to a further erosion of trust in institutions. So we've got to get ahead of that. And there are some, I think, very positive stories. Maybe, Liz, in the next answer, I can talk about Greece. I've just come back from Athens. And there is a, um, yeah. a very progressive government in action. I want to definitely hear about that because the, I want we want to end on positives here. Livio, uh, Ed was just talking about how quickly uh, the pharmaceutical world moved together. And you, you would hope that we will start to see once there is a viable vaccine, the distribution go globally and in a sharing world. Now, there are always going to be bad actors, Russia, China, North Korea. OK, so we don't know how they are going to participate in this. We know for a fact that already there have been hacking attempts on pharmaceutical companies trying to develop uh, vaccines here in the United States, which is is very disappointing. However, do you foresee a new world order of cooperation and collaboration when it comes to democratic societies? And does that also include um, the financial flow of money? You know, would we then start to see more understanding of the pain that people have gone through in many different countries and figure out ways, whether it involves the central bankers or, or world leaders, to ameliorate the situation? Yeah, uh, good question. So I think the the only successful way out uh, uh, from this is uh, is by uh, building uh, uh, bridges. Um, mm. On the one good hand, point. about people, uh, about people is that um, you know uh, many people were uh, were um, uh, discontent with uh, prior to the pandemic with a, a way in which uh, globalization's benefits were distributed. And of course, this pandemic, um, I, 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 okay, I call this that as a glexit, you know, uh, exit from globalization as we know, know it, because people really didn't, didn't, um, didn't feel all the benefits at individual level. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, unfortunately, the pandemic is just, uh, again, exacerbating this. Because like any recession in the past, it, 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 it will lead to an increase in inequality. Low and middle income households are disproportionately uh, hit. And therefore, uh, support policies uh, should, should gradually move from, you know, undiscriminate support for everyone to a more better targeted support for those really uh, vulnerable at individual level at company yeah. level and at sovereign level also. Indeed, I think there is a need for some restructuring of debt uh, for some vulnerable countries, and this cannot be with international cooperation. Um, I also think that's a very personal opinion, uh, does not involve the IMF in any way, uh, that uh, there is a logic behind the um, uh, corona bonds, uh, because uh, this is a global pandemic, and. Uh, you don't have to, um, of course, you don't have uh, to, to, let's say, to um, to support the debt pre-existing to the pandemic. But for new 
for new debt issued in order to deal with a pandemic, this is something that, uh, that that's strictly my personal opinion, that um, uh, um, uh, you know international community uh, could do because um, if one ca country or a couple of countries are, are out of this crisis, the crisis will not be over, and it's right. precisely because of globalization it will continue to come back. Uh, so it, it, it needs international cooperation to to resolve this uh, this Indeed. crisis. Absolutely, uh, Sergio. You know, keeping with the capitalist Western democratic theme, a lot of companies have gone under. 80,000 small businesses in just the last couple of months in America have shuttered their doors for good. Uh, where do you stand as a, as a banker with a heart? Because that's the sense that I'm getting from you uh, about looking forward at the individual and, and reclaiming banking position as, as a positive force, part of the solution. You know, uh, if we're free market people here, to to a rational extent, don't some businesses have to fail, have to consolidate? You know, we're about to give our airlines four separate carriers, possibly five, uh, a big bailout. It, it took them two weeks into the virus to come to Washington, D.C., begging for bailout money. Now, in the past, they had spent a lot of money, and this goes for lots of companies, I hope we have some company leader. Share buybacks, uh, you know, spending too much on their dividends, et cetera. And as a free marketer, I look at that and I say, hey, something bad happened. You weren't ready for it. You're gonna go under or be purchased by somebody else, be acquired by somebody else. We don't wanna see mass bankruptcies, et cetera, but where do you stand on that? And, and if you could just try and give a global picture of it. Uh, well, I don't think we have enough time. Um, not that I have many things to say, but I'm uh, not that I have many things to say, but I'm I'm myself full of contradictions on the subject. So uh, <clears throat> let's take it uh, one by one. First of all, when when what, what we learned, so or what I learned from my little history is that basically bailouts uh, uh, need to be explained at the end of the day to the taxpayers, um, and um, if you explain to the taxpayers uh, in terms of I need to do this bailout because that will make the society at the end more resilient and you are able to prove that this is one thing. Uh, or on the other hand, you can actually make the taxpayers shareholders and actually they should get dividends all of that if we are talking about free market. Uh, what we are witnessing today is a very confusing um, uh, action. And if you wanna still stay with the undervalue situation, I believe that this is one of the one of the things which will need to be addressed, uh, and that is uh, basically the um, um, the reaction which says we are going to give you support if you are not going to pay dividends. Right? You hear that all across industries, yeah. Um, yeah. everywhere. Right? There is not even a, a, a construction of a frame which says in case you are meeting these success indicators, which are going to give us the governments the uh, the clarity that we are not going to be uh, intervening via bailout, then you will have to actually pay your, uh, pay, your, uh, pay your shareholders. Why I believe this is dangerous even during these days, and then I'm going to go to, to, to what really hurts. Uh, I believe it's, it's dangerous because actually um, uh, societal transformation uh, creating the spirit of entrepreneurship, the ethics of work, the ethics of change, the ethics of transformation, the ethics of agility needs to be supported by capital. If now, when the time is really very bad, you are hurting the shareholders, no matter if we are talking about small shareholders or if we are talking about the pensioners okay. yeah. benefiting from, <clears throat> from the institutional investor work, I'm not so sure that you are creating a credible long-term story for the capital markets. In particular, I believe Europe needs an absolutely strong, strong, strong capital market in order to, in fact, support the execution of the very visionary uh, plan which lays ahead of us. And the very visionable, visionary, visionary plan which lays ahead of us is all around societal change, transformation, and innovation. You need equity capital to support that. Um, yeah. taking, 
contrary measures, right, will still keep us probably for the next 10 to 20 years in the position that you will see super high valuations, which are attracting large cohorts of innovators, innovators and entrepreneurs in US and very low valuations in Europe, which are basically in, in fact incentivizing the innovator with the extra mile. And they are just surrender, surrendering to the first strategic call. And I believe we need much stronger capital markets in Europe. Now, yeah. if I am to answer to your, to your question, I want to reiterate what I said a little bit earlier. Um, the economy is going to look different. Not all companies are going to survive. I believe that the short term role of the stakeholders because we are all stakeholders into the real economy. Let's make no mistake here. It's not about creditors, investors, entrepreneurs, companies, or the government. It's, it's about us. It's not us and them, it's us. It's about how do you provide enough agility and flexibility, including in the labor market, in the reskilling, multi-skilling, and upskilling of the workforce, in order to be able to very fast orientate uh, actually the redundant workforce from the businesses which are going to go under into, into places which are going to get traction and are going to be additive actually to the medium to long term growth. This is the short term. The long term is we do need, and I will close with that, we do need a significant reform of the education system. Indeed. Significant, yeah. right? We do need a significant reform of what we call research and development in, in Europe and putting it on a programmatic basis. Got and it. last but not least, we need very, very strong capital market. Why I believe in that? Because I believe we have a tool and that tool is good governance. In Europe, I believe we do have good governance which can support all this. One second, Livio. I just want to I just want to flag our, our viewers right now. We've got a couple of minutes left. I'm going to go Ed, Livio and then Rosa to end. But Ed, give us in, in a nutshell your, what you saw in Greece, because if any country was down for the count and about to turn to Russia for help, um, and by the way, I'm half Russian, so I'm allowed to say that, but um, you know, about to, to turn to other forms of help, tell me what you saw in the last couple of weeks on the ground in Athens. Yeah, I'm going to give you two reasons to be optimistic, Liz. Um, one is the uh, Greece example, so politics, and the other is a markets piece, just to pick up on some of the remarks that Sergio and Livio made. Um, first, first on Greece, I mean, this is an example of the revenge of the centre, if you like. You've had 10 years of austerity, of populism, of a um, challenged country. Um, and what you've seen over the past year, since the election of um, uh, Prime Minister Mitsotakis, is radical change. Change in terms of an administrative state that is far more focused on um, citizen outcomes in the past. Um, change in terms of reforms of the wider system, um, an investment uh, in digital, uh, uh, significant consideration around um, sustainability and climate and microdiversity and conservation. But moreover, what you've seen is a state that can face off against a huge domestic crisis, COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think I was saying, Liz, in our remarks earlier, when you look at the UK, there's been 600 deaths per million. Um, in um, Germany, I think it's 300 deaths per million. In Greece, it's 40. Now, that wasn't an accident. Uh, the way the government engaged with that issue, the fact that they lent on the experts, on the scientists to really drive the political decision making and decision making based on data, um, I think set Greece up for um, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a far more successful um, summer period than perhaps some of the other European nations. So there's a sense that the system is starting to reform, it's starting to change. And actually the, you see it in the approval ratings as well. And moreover, you see it in private sector support. So when I was in Athens on Monday, I saw the um, announcement of a partnership between Microsoft and the Greek government, um, a, wow. a commitment 
build, I think, three data centers to train, what, 100,000 people in digital skills, a big cultural um, digital project alongside that. So a significant, you know, endorsement in that government from the from the private sector. So I think it's very interesting that you could, you know, even after 10 years, countries can change. Uh, and I think the Greece story is a really yes. exciting one. And I think, as you mentioned earlier, you see that in the bond, you know, the bond yield represents this sense of, um, uh, 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 of competence. Final, final point um, about the markets. I think, and we haven't had the chance to talk about this, ESG and impact investing, I think mm-hmm. is, is a big, big market change. And, and, it, and it's there to address a problem, which is that businesses that are not thinking about their environmental impact, about their social impact, about their governance, have a less sustainable future than companies yes. that are. So that whole movement around impact investing, around purpose, around stakeholder, not shareholder consideration, I think is a big change. And I think if we can get that piece right, um, then I think the concerns around equality, around the kind of um, a distribution of wealth and opportunity will be, um, I hope, will be addressed. Yep, M- make it meld with good policy and profits. All right, uh, Livio, quick comment, and then I'm going to end with Rosa because I want to bring up something very important that's coming up on the calendar. Yeah. Go ahead, Livio, quickly. Okay, just. You you ask about the airline companies, and I want to say yes. I still have money. I still have money to get back from a big airline company who gets a government subsidy. Refund. So it's important. It's important <laughs> to gradually to grad for governments to gradually move from out from from this indiscriminate support to to businesses. Yeah. To uh, uh, what I would say is the the way out is uh, public investment in infrastructure. And, and here I would, I would want to back what Ed said, uh, that it's important that this investment would also crowd in private investments. Uh, and um, if they are ESG, green financing and socially responsible, that's even better. Just one word on two recent studies of the IMF, which I think are very relevant. One is that uh, public investments in infrastructure have a four times higher fiscal multiplier during recessions and mm. during normal times. So that's, that's, that's why all around the world they should invest more in infrastructure. And the second one uh, is that the infrastructure gap in, um, in the free seas uh, initiative countries, which encompasses 11 countries in, in Central Eastern Europe, including Romania, um, is the, the infrastructure gap is calculated by IMF to be 8% of GDP for each country during the next 10 years. That's a total 1.2 trillion. Wow dollars and um and but 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 if 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 at least one percent of gdp uh happen an, an increase of one percent of gdp happens for five consecutive years then gdp actually will grow by nine percent over the same period and actually the debt to gdp ratio even for the budget constrained countries would actually drop because pace ah. of growth of gdp yeah. would be higher than pace of growth of of debt, so it's a basically it's a win-win to invest in infrastructure, uh, especially if that in, if those investment uh, investments are backed by private investments, PPPs, uh, investment yeah. funds, and if they uh, focus on, I mean, taking this uh, crisis as an opportunity to to make structural reform and to shift to more uh, uh, green Indeed. financing. We are waiting on our infrastructure here in the United States. All right, as we finish up. Rosa, this October, the UN will mark its 75th anniversary. Um, I am sure we will hear a multilateral call to action, but what is the future there? Because so much of the world economic and supply chain stability depends on political and military stability in this world. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it's the UN um, and all the other international institutions that are going through a moment of crisis. And you mentioned October, the 75th anniversary of the UN. There are also the US elections coming up. And I think the outcome of that, of those elections, will actually um, chart the the next few years. Um, At the moment, uh, Europeans are 
not happy, shall we say, with the US's positions on multilateral institutions. And if international cooperation is going to get a boost, it also needs to come from what still is the most powerful um, country um, in the planet, uh, on the planet. So I think that um, that will be perhaps a, a very important appointment to, to chart um, the future. There's one thing I'd like to add, if I may, um, because we've talked a lot about continuity and change, and we've talked about globalization, whether it's coming to an end. Um, and I don't think we can have you know, clear-cut answers, yes or no. But on one thing, I think, uh, I think we can be a bit more assertive, and that is that the neoliberal model that has been embraced for the past 30, 40 years really is no longer attractive. And when we talk about invest public investment, when we talk about accompanying citizens towards transforming their work environment because their old jobs don't exist anymore, um, when we talk about diversifying supply chains, really we're talking about the neoliberal model that ha was bankrupt. Um, and I think that we can say um, no longer has political attraction on the left, and we knew that, but even on the right now. So we really need to find new solutions for you know, uh, the sort of global political and economic uh, governance. Um, and I, I do think that the international institutions that we have, such as the UN, with which you started, have a, a role to play, but they too need to be reformed, need to be changed um, in a more inclusive way. Rosa, Sergio, Liviu, Ed, what an honor to have you. On behalf of the Aspen Institute Romania, we thank you so much for participating in this crucial discussion. And we want to thank our participants out there in the Zoom and WebEx or wherever world you're joining us. We so appreciate you weighing in. And what an opportunity we've had to hear about the future of our world. I just do want to say that this panel would not have been possible without the key support of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Romania, our sincere appreciation to the ministry and all of the Aspen Institute uh, sponsors and organizers. I am Liz Clayman, Multimiri, merci, thank you, be well, danke, sei gesund, proche, la revedere. Have a wonderful day and we wish you all the very best, much success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.